For the next few videos, we'll be unpacking the different parts of the human eye. This is an amazing piece of optical engineering, and by understanding the different components in the eye, we can illuminate different aspects of optical physics. The first thing is that we have color vision, so we'll look at the optical spectrum. That is, we'll look and see what different wavelengths are absorbed and discuss a bit about why those wavelengths are important compared to other parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. Then we need Snell's law, which gives us refraction, and we need refraction, which you know, is bending of the light as it passes through media of different refractive index. We need that to build a lens, because the lens is an important part of the eye. And finally, we have then a thin lens formula that we can use to build optical instruments to improve, enhance, augment the performance of the naked human eye, so we can build microscopes and telescopes. But we're going to start here with color vision and the optical spectrum. So this is the part of the optical spectrum to which the human eyes are sensitive. It's a very narrow band of wavelengths between about 400 and 800 nanometers. And the human eye is basically insensitive to all these other different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, which is most of it. So our eyes sense a very limited part of this spectrum. And it's interesting to think about why that might be. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but first, what is the part of the eye that actually senses the light? How do we take a photon of light or a bit of light wave and convert that to something the brain can understand? This image here shows a cross-section of the detector part of the human eye. So when I say detector, I mean the part that takes the light and turns it into a signal that can travel to the brain. So the light comes in from the top and passes through these pink cells here, and these are actually nerve cells that run to the brain. So these are the cells that eventually carry the signal to the brain. But that signal originates from down here at the photoreceptors. So the photoreceptors are kind of where the magic happens. This is where the photon of light is converted into an electrical signal. And if you remember, to absorb a photon or to destroy light, you either have to accelerate charge or excite electrons. These photoreceptors use electron excitation. Now there are two different kinds of photoreceptor. One is the so-called cone cell. So these are two different cone cells here. The cone cells actually come in three different colors. They're sensitive at their peak sensitivity at red, green, or blue wavelengths. So three different types. And the way you tune that sensitivity is you have special molecules inside these uh, different cells that respond differently to different colors of wavelengths. So the red one is more likely to be absorbing red photons, and the blue one is more likely to be absorbing blue photons. And so that way you are more likely, the, the red one, the one that absorbs the red light will give a signal to a nerve which carries a red photon signal to the brain, and the blue one carries a blue photon signal to the brain. So the cones give you sensitivity to different colors and allow you to discern different parts of the color spectrum. The rods, that's these um, light blue ones here, they absorb all the different optical uh, wavelengths equally. And so they're actually best for night vision. They're much more sensitive to low levels of light, but they cannot discern color. So our eyes have two, well, actually, I guess four different kinds of receptors. There are the rods that do night vision, basically just black and white, and the cones that come in red, green, and blue flavors. The coating on the bottom here, interestingly, is very dark. It's kind of a black color, and this stops light from reflecting around inside the eyes. That would you know, reduce your visual acuity. So that's basically how our eyes work. Light comes in, electron is excited here, the electron starts a signal that goes into the nerve and the nerve carries a signal to the brain and your brain's job then is to somehow process this electrical information. Now I mentioned that the eye has three different color receptors, red, green and blue, but they're not sensitive to one wavelength of blue light, rather the blue receptor can detect a range of different light colors, but just the blue end of the spectrum. So this is the response of the blue cone, this is the response of the green cone, and this is the response of the red cone. And you'll see they overlap pretty strongly. If you detect a photon at 500 nanometers, it could be absorbed by any one of these sensors. But just on average, the blue one will absorb more blue, the red one more red, and the green one more green. And your eye and your brain does a fantastic job of interpolating these three different color sensors into a rich visual experience where you perceive all the different colors in the rainbow. So as you can see, the 
eye is really different to the ear. So the ear doesn't just detect three different frequencies of sound, it detects all the different frequencies. So it doesn't have to use this interpolation trick. Another really key difference is that the ear is phase sensitive. It detects the amplitude of the sound wave, whereas the eye just detects the number of photons, which is proportional to the square of the electric field, or just the energy in the light. So the human eye and the visual processing system of your brain is pretty amazing. But if you're talking about benchmarks of biological awesomeness, take a look at the eye of the mantis shrimp. This particular species of mantis shrimp has no fewer than 13 different color sensors. So as we have three that detect three different colors, it has 13 different distinct cells detecting 13 different primary colors. All the way from 300 nanometers, which is well beyond the human range of vision, all the way out to 700 nanometers and beyond. Why a mantis shrimp needs to do this is uh, a bit of a mystery. Uh, it's possible that whereas we interpolate the signal from three, these three different sensors and can see any color in the rainbow using three sensors, perhaps the mantis shrimp only sees in 13 color light, like the early computer monitors that could only display 16 colors. Maybe the mantis shrimp has 13 color vision and can't interpolate using its sensors, but we don't know because obviously we can't ask a mantis shrimp to find out. Now, another piece of the puzzle in terms of why we perceive the colors that we do is why do we only see such a small part of the electromagnetic spectrum? Why don't our eyes work in the far infrared or the ultraviolet? Well, one very good reason for that is the spectrum of the sun. So there are a few different curves here. Uh, this gray curve is the so-called black body spectrum. So that would be the spectrum of uh, something which is ideally hot and emitting that isn't a huge ball of hydrogen plasma. But don't worry about the gray curve. We don't really care about that for the time being. The yellow curve here is the spectrum of sunlight at the top of the atmosphere. And the red curve is the spectrum of sunlight after it reaches the Earth and passes through the atmosphere. And between these two dashed lines, this is the visible spectrum. And you can see that the sunlight on Earth peaks in the visible spectrum. This is where the sun is brightest. So if you're building a visual receptor, this is a great place to do it because that's where you have the most light. That's where you have the most photons. If we were living on a planet where our sun was a redder color, say, you know, a red giant, maybe our visual systems would be tuned to wavelengths over here. There are also some physical limits on how you might build an eye, at least the way that we know how to build eyes. It works on electron excitation in molecules. A photon comes in and excites an electron up to a higher energy level, and then this triggers a response in a nerve cell. You need to be able to build molecules that accept a range of energies that are, are feasible for these molecules. So if you, for example, trying to build an eye in the X-ray or ultraviolet region, these photons have so much energy that if you absorbed uh, a photon, maybe it's going to blow the molecule apart. So that could be really tricky. On the infrared side, um, it could be difficult as well. You've got to find electron energy levels that work for the, the wavelengths that you have. So the visual ra range and sort of, you know, from 300 through to 1000 nanometers is really good for uh, electron and molecular energy levels. It's a really convenient range of wavelengths to work because it's easy to build molecules that absorb, absorb light and absorb electromagnetic radiation at these wavelengths. Not to say you couldn't do it in other re regions, but it's a particularly good regime in which to work. So one of the interesting features of this graph that I'll mention in, in passing here is a, a curiosity, not something that I want to be a part of this course, but I've mentioned that you see these dips in the spectrum here uh, where you have light being absorbed by the atmosphere of the Earth. So the light from the sun is this yellow curve and then the atmosphere absorbs some of the light from the sun and it never reaches the Earth. So it, on Earth there's very little light at this wavelength here, for example because it's absorbed by water. Well, you can measure this spectrum on other planets in other solar systems. So this is a paper published in 2013 showing light that has passed through the atmosphere of an exoplanet. And you can see an absorption dip here due to the carbon monoxide in that exoplanet uh, atmosphere. So, you know, maybe we can speculate one day about what the visual systems of uh, alien life forms might be based on the spectra that other suns and other atmospheres have. 
The final spectrum I'll show is a spectrum of a fluorescent lamp. So the sun spectrum, as you remember, has is really bright between you know 400 and 700 nanometers. This is a spectrum of a fluorescent bulb, and it's quite a mess compared to the sun spectrum. It's not as smooth, and this is the reason why when you look at things under fluorescent light, they don't look the same as under sunlight because you're illuminating it with light that has particular colors that are different to that in sunlight. In particular, these lines here, the ones with the stars on them, are mercury lines. So one of the ingredients in a fluorescent bulb is a little bit of mercury vapor that emits brightly at these wavelengths. And this is one reason why, if you can possibly avoid it, do not put fluorescent light bulbs in the bin, because you'll be releasing mercury into the environment. There are better ways to dispose of fluorescent light bulbs.